interested? Uh, I'm vegan, Walter. In heaven, this little girl came up to me. She told me she died when you're coming. The pain that I suffered watching my son that close to death. We're in trouble.
him mic, sir. Praise the Lord. There it is. All right. We've got some chickens with us today, some fowl. I mean, there was fowl here already, but now legitimate fowl. Uh, how many roosters, Dean? One rooster. That's probably for the best. <laughs> so what happens is that rooster is going to crow occasionally if it acts according to its proper nature. And when that rooster crows, what do you do? Amen. amen. So uh, we'll have more amens today than we've ever had probably. But uh, thank you, Amy and Dean, for going to the trouble of bringing them in for us. If you haven't seen this place yet, we are in the middle of our spring program, Hatfields versus McCoys. And so half of you are Hatfields sitting on this side of the room. And half of you are McCoys sitting on this side of the room. And currently the Hatfields have a slight lead over the McCoys, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as time goes on. Hey, let's sing together. We're going to turn to page number 43 in our books. Stand with me if you're able. And we're going to sing all four verses of number 43, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. All four verses of number 43. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Good singing this morning. Praise the Lord. I'm glad that you're here this morning. I'm glad that you didn't go fishing this morning. You decided to come to church instead. You know, Nicole last year got into a little bit of trouble. Uh, I don't know if you, you did any fishing last summer or not, but it wasn't that great. <laughs> it wasn't that great around here, but, but Nicole was catching fish by the tub full. And she was catching so many fish that it caught the attention of the DNR. And so the DNR showed up at our house and uh, said, you know, we need to see what's going on because you're the only person in this county that's catching any fish. And so uh, the DNR went out on the boat with her and uh, she opened the, the, the side compartment there. <laughs> this may get out of hand, I don't know. And uh, she pulled out a stick of dynamite and a box of matches. And so she lit the match, lit the dynamite, 
threw it into the lake, and boom! Bass and catfish floating to the surface of the lake. And the DNR agent said, Nicole, you can't do this. This is against the law. You can't fish. And while he's talking, while he's talking to her, she lights another stick of the dynamite, you know, lights the match, and psss, that uh, fuse starts burning, and she tosses it at the DNR guy. And so he's holding it, and he says, what are you doing? I told you, this is illegal. You can't do this. And she said, are you going to argue, or are you going to fish? <laughs> anyway. God bless us this morning. Let's pray. And hey, while we're praying, if the uh, rooster crows, let's, <laughs> let's keep praying. Amen. I better pray fast. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that we can come and have fun in your house. I pray your blessings upon all that we say and do this morning. Bless the music, the song service, the, uh, the time of contest, and and then the message to follow. Strengthen your people today, please. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> Perfectly timed. You may be seated. You may be seated. Number 114 is our next song. 114, Tell It to Jesus, singing just verses 1, 2, and 4 of number 114. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Do the tears flow down your cheeks unbidden? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Have you sins that to men's eyes are hidden? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. For Christ's coming kingdom are you sighing? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Very good, very good. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the contest and how things have been going. We left it Wednesday night with a certain score, but uh, you may not uh, have been privy to the change after Thursday night. We do keep track of our Thursday night soul winning attendance as well. And that night, boy, you McCoys, you made some ground uh, up here. There were three Hatfields on the soul winning bus on Thursday night and 10 McCoys on the soul winning bus. And so the McCoys came back uh, with seven additional points there. So what that leaves us now is 295 for the Hatfields and 265 for the McCoys. So trust me, that 30 points, it can vanish. I mean, just that quick. It doesn't take long at all. So you McCoys, don't get disheartened. Uh, in fact, we, we want you to, to be within one point of the Hatfields. But uh, we hope it's one point under the Hatfields, right? I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't be on a team. That's why it's, it's not as, uh, what do you call that, uh, biased. <laughs> biased. So, Brother Rick, will you count your side up, please? Brother Brent, will you count your side up? Let me tell you, while they're counting, another way you can do it, take a picture with your phone of your teams over here and contact your team members. Half of the battle, half the battle is getting your team members to church. 
uh, you know, you, you, you can count them Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night at Soul Winning as well. So uh, reach out, get your people here. Bob and Janet, welcome home. We're glad to have you here. Looks like you're in McCoy now. So McCoy's, congratulations. You gained Bob and Janet. Give Bob and Janet a nice hand. This is going to be a rowdy service, isn't it? <laughs> Brent, do you have a total? 28. All right. And do you have a total? 20. All right. Very good, Rick. Thank you. 285 then for the McCoys, and then 323 for the <laughs> Hatfields. All right. Praise the Lord. Uh, we did this program eight years ago. Uh, in 2013, and back then we made a couple of really goofy videos. And so we figured we'd, we'd go ahead, they, since they take so much time to make uh, and they go along with our theme, we figured, well, we may as well go ahead and show them again. So uh, Aaron, do you have the video there for us? Very good. I'll sit down, make sure that the sound is, is good for us, and you take this for what it is. <laughs> Hi y'all, I'm Daisy Mae Hatfield and I'm Maisie Day McCoy and you're watching W H I K News, your leading leader, leader, leader <laughs> and in Hillbilly News. Tonight's top story, we caught one of those nasty, raunchy, old stinky McCoys picking their nose. You didn't either. We did too. No, sir. No, yeah. sir. No, sir. No, sir. You did not. Yes, we did. No, sir. Yes, we did. I believe it. Oh, well, I had the moving pictures to prove it. You never saw me do nothing. I never said it was you. <gasps> Since you brought it up. <laughs> Now see, I told you it wasn't me. I swear on this Bible that was not me. You better not go swearing on that Bible. It was you. I saw you. I saw those pictures. I got a twin sister. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. No, you don't. I do. You just ain't never met her. And you, and you know, you know, you know, them Hatfields ain't no perfect folks either. No, we ain't perfect, but we better than the McCoys. They seen some, I seen some nasty, nasty, nasty girls. She come out of the old, um, outhouse with some fancy, fancy toilet paper stuck on her shoe. No. Yes, sir. You did not see that. I did. I got rid of it before anybody could see this. <laughs> I don't think so. We got footage, folks. You. I yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Oh, no. You no, heard no, about my, no. my boyfriend, Cletus? Oh, mm-hmm. You're just jealous. I got me a man in the city. I know all about your man. Boy, so you and your baby man think she's some little boyfriend, Cletus, of hers. I wish I had a boyfriend. Her. I got 
put your eyes in her. And I have a real life boyfriend. My step's not so good, but let's see how prettier than she is. I'm so afraid of her. I'll show her. You know what? We might be a little mean, but at least we ain't crooks. That's a serious vaccination you're making there, Daisy Mae. It's not no vaccination when you got the proof. The only proof you got is harm. Proof. <laughs> Let's see her cut to my proof right now. Let's see it. vaccination you done made. That was my brother's truck and I was helping him fix a flat tire. That there tire looked like it was fully bowed up to me. You leave me no choice. Roscoe, roll it. But I'm gonna tell you something, ain't neither one of y'all gonna like what you're about to see. church here but it sure does help doesn't it all right that's that's daisy may hatfield and Maisie day mccoy did i get that right and uh we'll see more from them next week too how about that all right let's go to our final song here number 160 how in the world do you preach after a service like this that's what i want to know 160 turn your eyes upon jesus just verses one and three this morning of number 160. O oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior And life more abundant and free Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face and the 
things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace his word shall not fail you he promised believe him and all will be well then go to a world that is dying his perfect salvation to tell turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace very good thank you for singing this morning children you may be dismissed elementary aged kids you can head on down to class those of you staying we're turning to the book of first samuel this morning chapter number 17 first samuel chapter number 17 thank you shannon for taking care of that class amen, amen. Please pray for Shannon and her family. She got word this morning that her grandmother passed last night. She was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer uh, about six months ago or so. She decided she didn't want any treatment. I think she was 89 years old, and, uh, and the Lord decided to take her home last night. Thank you for praying for her up until now. Please pray now for the family, of course, as they'll mourn the passing of Eleanor Hill, and we'll be heading down there this week for the funeral, so any prayers for safety and travel would be a blessing. Amen. All right, 1 Samuel chapter number 17, we'll be reading verses 20 on down through 26, probably a familiar passage to you. Amen. I don't know who's going to be more wore out by the end of the service, him or us. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse number 20. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessing on our message here this morning. I pray that you'd accomplish by it what you desire to accomplish. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts and do the work that needs to be done today, please. I pray you'd encourage and strengthen your people. If anyone here this morning doesn't know Christ as Savior, Father, would today be the day that they make certain of that. We love you. We praise you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you probably know this story. You probably know it very well. But the Philistines and the Israelites have gathered together at the Valley of Elah to do battle one against another. The Philistines are the ones provoking the fight. 
the Israelites are showing up there to defend themselves. And the way the valley was structured was pretty simple. There was a mountain range on this side, and there was a mountain range on this side, and right in between the two was the Valley of Elah. And the Philistines had assembled themselves on one side of the valley in the foothills of the mountains, and the Israelites had uh, positioned themselves on the other side of the valley in the foothills of the mountains. And so what happens is, rather than the two armies coming down and clashing and going to battle, a champion, as he's called here, named Goliath, comes down into the valley. And he gets into the middle of the valley, and he makes a proclamation. He says, send one of your men to come and fight me. And if he defeats me, then my people will be your servants forever. But if I defeat him, then you people will be our servants forever. No one stepped up to fight him. It's probably because Goliath was one of the descendants of a family called the Anakites. He was a son of Anak. And they were giants. Given the height that we're told in the Bible for Goliath, in our measurements, he would be nine feet and six inches tall. That's a big boy right there. In fact, a regulation basketball goal, the rim is set at ten feet. And so if Goliath were standing underneath of said goal, then it would only be six inches from the top of his head to the bottom of that basketball rim. I don't think Shaq could even defend against Goliath very well. And uh, he not only uh, was, was the size that he was, but he was fully outfitted in his armor. The Bible tells us that he had a helmet on his head and that he had a chain mail coat of armor. I'm told that that coat of armor weighed at least 78 pounds. Can you imagine putting on a 78 pound coat? Of course, some of you who are in the military, you wore field packs that were 45 and 60 pounds, maybe even upwards of 80 pounds at times, so you have an idea of how much that extra weight is. But ideally, you're not fighting with it on. And he's there in that coat, 78 pounds. I've had some people say it could have weighed as much as 154 pounds. We don't know for sure. But a guy who's nearly 10 feet tall... I need these roosters here more often. You're encouraging me every time you say amen. Uh, he, anybody who's 10 feet tall can handle the weight of that thing. He had a spear in his hand, and the, the diameter of the shaft of the spear was two and a half inches, and the head of the spear weighed 15 pounds. Could you imagine holding a piece of PVC pipe that's two and a half inches around with a 15-pound bowling ball attached to the end of it? How well do you think you'd manage that weapon? Probably not all that well. But Goliath and his strength was able to wield it without any kind of issue. And so here he is, completely outfitted in armor with a 15-pound spearhead at nearly 10 feet tall. And he says, come on, any one of you Israelites, guess how many of them stepped up to fight Goliath? Zero. None of them showed up to fight him. He was in that valley 40 days. No fighting had commenced. No battling was going on. Every day, Goliath had come down into that valley and threaten the Israelites and make the claim, if you can beat us, we'll be your servants. And for 40 days, no one came. He's mocking the Israelites every day. He's wearing them down. He is mocking their God. He says, send me a man to fight. And if we'd read through the beginning part of the chapter, we would have found that Saul, the king of Israel, and all the men of Israel, it says, were dismayed and greatly afraid. Well, while this is all going on, Jesse sends his shepherd boy son, David, to go check on his brothers and to bring them some food. And so David packs up everything that his dad wants him to go with, and he, he heads 
toward the valley of Elah. And there are the armies, the armies of the Philistines on one side and the armies of Israel on the other. And he hunts down his brothers and he finds his brothers. And he starts to give them the things that their dad had said for him to send. There are three of David's brothers there fighting. And David is the youngest of eight boys. David is most likely 15 years of age here. Here's why we come to that conclusion. You had to be 20 years of age to fight and to be in a part of the army. And only three of the sons of Jesse were fighting here. So we reckon that they're 20, 21, 22 years old, right in that time frame. David, being the youngest of eight, would push him back into his teens and most likely 15 years of age. And so he shows up as a 15-year-old teenager and he sees what's going on here and he's wondering why nobody's doing anything about it. His brother Eliab gets angry with him. Eliab's the same guy that Samuel thought was going to be the anointed king and then was rejected because God saw the heart of him compared to the heart of David and said, I'd rather have David be my king. And so Eliab and David, they don't really get along anymore. And so David, in verse number 26, we read again the second half of the verse. He says, What shall be done to the man who killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? He says, you know, I don't like how this guy's talking. I don't like how he's talking about us. And I certainly don't like the way he's talking about our God. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God. I want to talk to us this morning about the characteristics of a giant killer. The characteristics of a giant killer. I've got 14 things here, so buckle up. We'll probably not finish this this morning. I'm supposed to preach something else different tonight. We'll see how it goes. First characteristic of a giant killer. Number one, they are not lazy. If you're going to be a giant killer, you can't be a lazy person. Verse number 20 of 1 Samuel 17. And David rose up when? Early in the morning. David rose up early in the morning. If you're going to kill giants, you can't be lazy. you got to get up. I pick on this once in a while because there's a trend in our society that is not good. People sleeping until noon, 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then staying up till 3 or 4 or 5 in the morning. That's not God's intention for you. Thank you, Rooster. Came in right on time there. God's not, His intention isn't for us to sleep all day and stay up all night. Now, if you have a third shift job, that really doesn't apply to you. You're not being lazy. That's just your shift. I've worked third shift jobs. I've done security at GM plants where I was a third shift worker. I've loaded package trucks during the middle of the night. And so I've been there and done that. And most third shift workers will even tell you, yeah, God didn't make us to do this. He didn't make us to stay up all night and then to sleep during the day. That's why there's this giant ball of fire in the sky between the hours of what, right now about 6.20 in the morning until about 8.30 or so at night. And as we approach June the 21st, it'll get in the sky earlier and earlier and it'll be in the sky later and later. I don't know, some of you may need to hear this, but you might be shocked to know that the light, the sun doesn't just turn on in the sky like a light bulb does. It actually, amen, it actually gradually rises over the eastern horizon and it lights up the sky and, and as we rotate on our axis, we see it then set in the western sky. What am I saying this morning? It's very simple. Get out of bed. Get up in the morning and join the rest of the world because I know what you're doing because I'm watching society do it. Amen. I'm liking this guy all of a sudden. Now that I'm preaching, he's on my side. Uh, I, I'm, we know what society's doing. What are we doing? We're just online. We're letting YouTube run. 
We're, we're on Facebook. We're on TikTok. We're on Instagram. And I'll tell you what you're doing. You're wasting your life. There is nothing positive or helpful that comes from that. Nothing. It may be entertaining. It may kill some time. But consider this. All your life consists of is time. So when you're killing time, you're just killing yourself. You're wasting your life. You teenagers, you've got to snap out of this thing because you're going to develop a habit in your life and you're going to become pretty useless. Shannon and I were out visiting yesterday and it was tough because uh, when we go see people, you never know if you're going to catch them home or awake. And nobody that we visited was awake yesterday. And we were out at noon. That's not good, people. Now, if they worked all night and they were in bed at noon, God bless them, right? But we've covered that, amen. We covered that already. Man, don't waste your life online. And look, I, I need downtime like anybody needs downtime. I've got some things that I go to and uh, some things that I do for some recreation. But if, if, if you check your phone and you check your iPad or your laptop and you look at your usage, because your phone will tell you that now, how much time you spent on Twitter and how much time you were on Instagram, how much time you were on Facebook, it'll tell you how much time you were on those apps. And you've got to ask yourself, do I want to face Jesus Christ at the judgment seat and have him pull that same chart up? Amen. And have him say, hey, you know, look at, look at what you did with the time that I gave you. I'll tell you, I read it this week. I think I mentioned it Wednesday night. The trouble we have right now is there's no lion in the street and there's plenty of food, especially now. And I'm hearing of a fourth stimulus check and another fifth stimulus check being planned. And look, for folks that need some help and, 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 you know, their jobs have been sidelined, which I'm not sure is the case anymore. Because everywhere I go, there are help wanted signs. Even Talon got a job this week. And if Talon can get a job, anybody can get a job. <laughs> if they're hiring Talon, no, I'm picking on it. But, hey, man, you, you can't sleep your life away and you can't surf your life away. Man, break that habit. Get up in the morning when the sun comes up and do something with your day. Do something productive and helpful and beneficial for your family, for the people you love, for society. I got news for you. You're not going to do a lot of service for the Lord at 3.30 in the morning. In fact, most of the bad stuff happens after the sun goes down. You read through the book of Proverbs and, and Solomon says, you know, in the evening I saw among the simple ones a man void of understanding and he was in a place that he shouldn't have been doing things that he shouldn't have been doing. The Bible says men love darkness because their deeds are evil. Some of you are afraid if you get up at a decent hour somebody's going to put you to work and you're right. But there's no lion in the street. There's, you, you have nothing to worry about. All your bills are paid. And there's food in the refrigerator. And the heat runs when it's cold and the AC runs when it's hot. There's gas in the tank of the car and you just have need of nothing. And the Bible tells us one of the greatest threats to Christianity is prosperity. Because when we're warmed and filled, we just want to sit back and do nothing think about amen think about Thanksgiving Day how much work gets done on Thanksgiving Day usually not a whole lot my dad's house he, yeah the ladies work that's right us guys we don't do much right what's happening we're eating that turkey and that mashed potato that tryptophan kicks in we find us a spot on the couch or better yet that recliner and we're good for nothing huh People live that way every day. People don't know how to work anymore. Amen. Now we're all working at home. Working at home. Huh? David rose up early in the morning. We got 14 points. I should move on. 13 to go. <laughs> 
giant killers aren't afraid of going to work. By the way, this same David later on did lay in bed till the middle of the day. Remember that day? That's the day that he committed adultery with a woman. There is a connection. There is a correlation. Verse number two. They know how to obey their authorities. Giant killers know how to obey their authorities. Verse number 20. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. Jesse's David's father. And David's father said, David, here's what I need you to do. I need you to take this food and these care packages and I need you to take them down to the Valley of Elah where your brothers are doing battle and I want to make you to make sure that your brothers get this care package. And The Bible says that David did as Jesse had commanded him. We need to get back to the day when, when young people obeyed their parents. And by the way, as long as you're living at home, you're obligated to obey your parents. If they have rules in the home, then you follow those rules. You say, I don't like those rules. Then move out. Go support yourself. But as long as you're sucking up their food and heat, you are obligated and you owe it to them to obey them and to do the things that they ask you to do. And there's tension in the room right now, and I'm not sure why. All you parents ought to be crowing amen as loud as this rooster's crowing up here. Don't be afraid of your children. For goodness sakes, they can't even support themselves. What are you afraid of? Huh? Now you think it's just mean-spirited. This, this is what your parents told you? This is what your grandparents told them? Huh? Obey. You teenagers that think you're figuring stuff out and you're 13. You haven't figured anything out yet. You don't have any idea how the world works. Huh? Look, look what teenagers are out here doing. We brought it up in Sunday school. Maybe we just brought it up 10 minutes ago and I forgot already. That could be. We had a shooting nearly every day in this city in the last six or eight or 10 days. I'm seeing the news stories. 16-year-old shot. 15-year-old shot. Huh? What, what's going on? We got a bunch of out of control children who don't even know how to settle a matter without killing the other person. We got a bunch of parents who aren't doing the job parenting their kids. I remember seeing billboards, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, do you know where your children are? And I used to see those as, as a young person and I'd go, what? If I were out at 2 in the morning, my dad would be in that Chevy Malibu driving the streets of this city looking for me and it wouldn't be a good moment for me when he found me he'd be dragging me home Ben Franklin I'm told had some visitors over to his house one evening and they got talking and carrying away and at 10 o'clock he opened his pocket watch looked at it and stood to his feet and said well sir madam it seems that I must retire now for all good and decent people are at home at this hour Huh? It wasn't last summer that up here at Clio and, and Pearson Road and that, that parking lot of that, that mall area up there, there were some, I don't know, 80 or 100 young people up there, 2 o'clock in the morning, and they say that over 70 shots were fired. 2 o'clock in the morning, up partying with people they shouldn't have been with at a time they shouldn't have been with them. Look, man, you, you teenagers, you need to realize that those of us who are older than you that still need help from you in figuring out how to create a social media account, just because you, know, you know how to do that doesn't mean you know how to live life. Doesn't mean you know how to keep a marriage together. Doesn't mean you know how to raise some kids for the glory of God. Doesn't mean you even know how to pay some bills. You need to listen to your parents and listen to your grandparents and listen to your preacher and learn how to do this thing called life because you're messing it up. God help us. 15-year-old girl shot to death in her driveway because she's charging someone with a butcher knife in her hand in front of a cop. What's going on in this world? 
Well, her dad was kicking another girl in the head, so that's part of it. You teenagers need to submit to the authorities that God's put in your life. And we'll go ahead and pick on the authorities some. It would help us authorities, amen, to uh, the roosters in favor of picking on the authorities. Uh, it'd help if us authorities were an example worth living up to. We, we've had enough of this do as I say, not as I do leadership. Get out of here with that. I remember sitting at a kitchen table with one of my relatives taking drags off a cigarette. Deep, long drags. And they said to me, if I ever catch you smoking, I'll break your arm. Now, to be fair, it worked. I was intimidated enough. But uh, don't teach me that way. If you're telling me something's the way that it is, live it yourself. Send my... <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> no one will ever be a leader who doesn't first learn to be a follower. No one will ever learn to be a giant killer until they first learn to do what they're told. Leadership requires humility. No one wants to follow a proud leader. Roosters cause a havoc, don't they? What are, what are the girls' names? Bert and Ernie. The girls are named Bert and Ernie. <laughs> What's the rooster's name? Oh, it's just rooster? <laughs> Dinner, yeah. He's going to be hoarse after this morning's over. Leadership requires humility. People unwilling to submit and follow aren't humble people. Now we're talking about godly authority here. We're not just talking about any old Yahoo that wants to tell you what to do. And we're also not talking about when, hey amen, when, when, when human authorities' directions go against God's authority. Peter said to the council that said you can't preach Jesus anymore he said we ought to obey God rather than men but we need to get back to submitting to the authorities God puts in our lives the book of Proverbs says this reprove not a scorner lest he hate thee rebuke a wise man and he'll love thee how do you act when you're corrected when someone calls you out for your nonsense do you bristle and get angry it's funny, I interviewed 12 young men for our assistant pastor position, and I asked every one of them, I said, how do you respond when you're corrected? And every one of them said, I hate it. I said, you hate what? He said, I, I hate being corrected. I said, well, how do you respond to it? They said, well, it takes me a day or two to get past it. I'm thinking, you're kidding me. A day or two? My mother used to tell me, change a look on your face or I'll change it for you. Huh? Now it takes young men who are in Bible college a day or two to get over a correction. What's that tell you? We have a generation steeped in pride. You know what they do when you head to boot camp? They bring you in, they sit you in a barber chair, and they shave every follicle off your head. Virgil's never grew back. And then they give you the same clothes, the same pair of glasses if you need glasses, and the same pair of boots. And they strip you of your individuality. If anything's been overrated in society these days, it's our individuality. Let me tell you something special, Snowflake. You are unique and important just like everybody else. You don't matter any more than your next door neighbor does and you're not so special. I don't have time for this. I'm only on point number two. Number three, characteristics of a giant killer. Giant killers get done what they're given to do. Verse number 22, And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. What did Jesse tell David to do? Go see his brothers. What did David do? When he saw his brothers. He didn't get sidetracked on the way. He didn't, you know, let some guy in a back alley, hey, psst, come on over here, buddy. What you got there? Some food? I'll, I'll take it from you. Hey, I'll give you this for it instead. Hmm? He didn't trade it for some magic beans. He didn't 
get sidetracked. He got the job done. He knew the importance of focus and fulfilling his responsibilities. Jesse said, go see your brothers, and he does. Giant killers have follow through. They finish what they start. They're not quitters. They stay after it until it gets done. I've heard this saying until I'm sick of it. You don't get what you expect, you get what you inspect. This is in most leadership books that I read, and, and a lot of them are, are secularly oriented. But I'll say this, that, that, that may be true, but it shouldn't be true for giant killers. If I got to follow up on you, you're not a giant killer. If, if, if I got to check you bus captains and make sure that your route's getting visited, you're no giant killer. Hello? If I got to check you Sunday school teachers and make sure you're teaching the lessons that we're giving you, you're no giant killer. Huh? Nobody should have to follow up on you and make sure you get your job done. My dad does so much stuff around here, I don't even know all that he does. But I do know this, that if he's doing something, I'm not checking up on it. First off, if I do, I'm going to find it done and done well. Secondly, if he finds me checking up on it, he'll say, if you want, you can just do it yourself. And so, no, I trust you. You get her done, right? Hey, nobody should have to check up on you. If you give someone your word that you're going to do something, you want to follow through and make it happen. Hello. Giant killers get done what they're given to do. Let's read verses 23 and 24 here. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion. Look at him. Goliath's called a champion. The Philistine of Gath. That's not a good amen point, Brewster. The Philistine of Gath. Goliath by name. Out of the armies of the Philistines. And spake according. Lost my place over there. Uh, to the same words. And David heard them. Meaning. He's throwing off on Israel and on the Lord. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. That's a good load of benefits for killing one guy. You get a, a, a wife out of the deal, amen, and your dad's house gets paid off. Not too shabby. Look at David, verse 26. David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? Giant killers know right from wrong. Giant killers know right from wrong. Talon was with me. The rooster got the rest of you with me. David knew that to be on God's side was right and to fight against God was wrong. Let me tell you what's happening in our culture in this country today. Everything we've ever been taught was right we're now being told is wrong. And everything that we've ever been told is wrong, we're now being told is right. The state of Tennessee this past week passed legislation that said that parents are to be informed any time a transgender student is going to be playing athletics with their child. So for instance, if a boy who makes the claim that he's a girl decides that he wants to start playing basketball on the girls basketball team, then all of the parents of the girls who play basketball are to be notified. And you know what the world is saying about that? Oh, well, that's bigotry. It's insanity to put a boy on a girl's team in the first place. 
I don't mean to be unkind, but we're also very commonsensical around here, so don't take offense, ladies. Men are stronger than ladies, generally speaking. Now, is there an occasional Bertha that can take the occasional Harold? Probably. Right? But by and large, we talked Wednesday night about Roger Bannister being the first man in recorded history to break the four-minute mile. And how since he did it in 1954, 1,497 more men have broken the four-minute mile. You know how many ladies have broken the four-minute mile? Zero. It's not an insult. We're just built differently. Ladies can have children. Men cannot. Men can run the four-minute mile, and ladies cannot. Generally, the men run it to get away from their children. Anyways, but uh, I digress here. We're different. So for you to put a biological male on a sports team with biological females, you're asking for trouble, especially if you want to put them in the same locker room together. And let's not even get started on either the insincerity and dishonesty of a transgender boy or the mental illness of a transgender boy. This is not normal. It's not typical. It's wrong. And when I say it's wrong, I can go viral for being a bigot. It's insane what this world has come to. And if you're not careful, they'll start making you think that you're the one who's crazy. But giant killers know the truth. You say, well, I'd like to know the truth. Well, I'd like to introduce him to you. His name is Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. The Bible says of itself, thy word is truth. You want to find out the truth? Get in this book. What is the truth? God created the male and female. Man shall leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's what God planned. Male and female. Not male and female and non-binary and pan, and I don't even know if I know what I'm talking about. I'm kind of glad that I don't. Because it's ridiculous nonsense. It's a way to play a game and play a system and deny God. Read Romans chapter 1 this afternoon. You'll see it laid out there. It's, a, it's a, a path to ultimate destruction. But it's a path, and we're well on it. And let me tell you what they're doing. They're taking the minds of our young people, and they're putting them in these public indoctrination centers they call schools. They're poisoning the minds of our kids. I heard a preacher talking about a discussion he was having with someone about the pros and cons of Christian education versus public education. And he was for Christian education. He was trying to start a Christian school, help pioneer the movement in the state of Michigan, actually, back in the 70s. And the preacher he was talking about was, he said, well, we try to let our kids stay in the public schools so that they can be a positive influence on the kids in those schools. He says, you know, the, the schools are filled with sparrows. And so we take our canaries and we put them into the schools with the sparrows to teach the sparrows to sing like a canary. And the man who was pro-Christian school said, you know, I've seen that done through the years, and i got to be honest with you, I've never met yet a sparrow that sung like a canary but I've met a lot of canaries that no longer sing. Look, you become like the people you hang around. And as long as our kids are going into these schools and they're being taught that all of this stuff is okay, then we're going to lose them. We're going to lo lose their hearts. We're going to lose this next generation. We're going to lose this nation. Somebody has to be willing to stand up and declare the truth and stick with it, regardless of the vitriol that comes our way. And let's be honest about it, 
the internet is a fairy tale land that doesn't truly exist. First off, you don't know who that other person is you're talking to or you're reading that typed out some stupidity. It very well could be that they're nine years old. My brother and I, back in the day, we used to play Call of Duty on, on our computers. And uh, there were back in the day, and they may still be, I don't know, but uh, they had clans where they're basically you know, armies that you, you could start your own clan, you could give it a name, you could determine whether or not someone could be a part of the clan. And so my brother and I, we, we used to play smaller maps with fewer numbers of people, and uh, we were playing against this one other guy, it was just the three of us, and man, he was really good, and we were having fun, and, uh, and then he said, hey, you guys want to try out to join my clan? We said, yeah, sure. And uh, so he's like, okay, so I just need you one at a time to play. And uh, out, of, out of 10 kills, you know, if you can, if you can kill me at least five times, then, then I'll let you in the clan. And uh, funny, one-on-one, -on -one, we did better against him than we did when it was the three of us playing. But anyhow, long story short, we both make the clan. And so then we're like, oh, cool. And so well, who are you anyways? He, oh, I live in the UK. Oh, very nice. What's your name? I forget what his name was. And they said, oh, yeah, how old are you? He was like, I'm 11. In our heads, he was our age. Because we couldn't see him. We didn't know who he was. He was reasonably intelligent. Because we're just playing the video game, right? But you never know. You might be reading some post written by some idiot. And you probably are. If it's idiotic. You don't know who you're talking to. In fact... There are more teenagers online than there are of us. We all have jobs. We're busy. We're working. Yeah, talent says amen. I got a job. <laughs> and so, anyway, we get the point, right? David knew right from wrong, and giant killers know right from wrong. Number five, he knew who the enemy was. He knew who the enemy was. Verse number Let's jump down here to verse number 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, this is David's eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. Because David's saying, you know, who's going to shut this guy up? And so Eliab hears David say that, and Eliab says to David, or Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why camest thou down hither? And with whom, look at here, how condescending this jerk is. With whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? He's trying to belittle David. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. David said, what have I now done? Basically, it's saying, Eliab, what's your problem? Huh? Giants know who the true enemy is. Who's the enemy in this story? Goliath. Who's Eliab fighting? David. Who kills the giant? David. Why doesn't Eliab kill the giant? He's fighting the wrong enemy. Giant killers know who the enemy is. Giant killers don't waste time fighting with their own. They fight the enemy. Let me tell you, church, you have three enemies as a Christian. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Your pastor isn't your enemy. Don't fight me. We're on the same side. You're not my enemy. I shouldn't fight you. We're on the same side. You shouldn't be fighting each other. Cats, roosters, what's going on around here? We're on the same side. We don't need to be fighting each other. Someone said the Christian army is the only army who kills its own wounded. I was listening to a, a comedian, actually, a Christian comedian from way back in the day. His name is Jerry Clower. I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not. Jerry Clower is telling the story about a friend of his who'd fallen. He went into sin. 
And so he went to one of the deacons at his church and said, Hey, you know, my friend here is, is messed up and he's made some mistakes. And I was wondering if you'd visit him with me so that we could pray for him and, and encourage him. And the deacon said, Well, what did he do? I won't go and see him unless you tell me what he did. Why do we need to know that? Why do we want to know that? There you go. Jerry said, he said, well, you know, I'll tell you, but then we're going to have to go and just get a, a bucket of stones so we can stone him. He's kidding, of course. Why do we need to know bad things about other people's lives? Someone says, uh, you know, I was worried about coming to church here because of my past. Oh, do tell. Huh? We're so eager to hear negative details about people's lives. Why is that? And by the way, some of us are a little too eager to share them. It's as though you're glory or something. You should never glory in sin. You should be grateful that God pulled you out of that mire and set your feet upon a rock. You don't glory in your shortcomings and your sin. But that, that, that's where we, th this whole sermon, by the way, could be demonized in today's society. Giant killers, who will stand up for the giants? Someone needs to support Goliath here. Yeah, the one running God down in the valley with a 15-pound spear in his hand looking to take the head off of the next guy that steps down. We're insane. Lost our collective minds. Number five. There's, there's, <laughs> there's no age limit to being a giant killer. There's no age limit to being a giant killer. The three sons of Jesse that are there are 20, 21, 22, possibly. They didn't do any giant killing. But the 15-year-old that showed up did. Huh? And I was a bus captain when I was 16 years old. I was teaching Sunday school when I was 16 years old. I was leading a junior church of, I don't know, 60 or 70 kids when I was 17 years old. Young people can do the work of God. Young people should do the work. I'm reading the book of Samuel in the mornings now, and we're just four chapters into it. But we read in chapters 2 and 3 how Samuel, as a child, with Eli, ministered unto the Lord and ministered unto Eli. Sometimes he's on cue. Children can serve God. Children should serve. And by the way, you see, there is no service for God outside of serving people. Those of us who are adults, we generally preach the gospel. We witness. We invite people to church. We have cars. We can drive them. We go pick people up. We bring them to church. Things of that nature. We go and we, we buy some groceries and we bring them to somebody's house. Teenagers can't always do those kinds of things. They don't have cars or they don't have driver's licenses. They don't have money to buy groceries for people. So you know who teenagers serve? They serve the people that are serving those people. You teenagers, find an adult in this church who's busy for God. Go up to them and say, is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything I can do to help you? Is there anything you need that I can get for you? And you serve them. One of the most important jobs on a bus is the runner. Now, you've got to have a driver because somebody's got to drive the bus. You've got to have a captain because somebody's got to manage the whole thing. But you know what you also need? You need a runner. You need a runner who's not going to get hit by a car. That's a good first step in a runner. You need a runner who's not going to allow any children to get hit by cars. That's even more important than them not getting hit. We're all right with some of ours getting hit. We just don't want any of theirs getting hit, right? I'm kidding. 
we need somebody to go to that door with some enthusiasm. Hey, the bus is here. Time to go to church. Not. You're not coming today, are you? Not now. Man, enthusiasm attracts people. Excitement. Get some kids on the bus. Hey, I'm glad you answered the door because we're having hamburgers today on the bus. And that's true. We're having McDonald's hamburgers on the bus today. And then this was pretty cool. Nicole was out visiting her out, and she passed a flyer out to one of the moms and said, Hey, tell Janiah we're having hamburgers on the bus tomorrow from McDonald's. And the lady said, Oh, and French fries? And Nicole said, No, we can't afford French fries, just the hamburgers. And the mom said, You know what? I'll buy French fries for everybody. And so tonight, French fries are on Janiah's mom. Come on out. But, uh, but hamburgers and French fries on the bus. Man, if you can't get a little kid excited about McDonald's hamburgers and French fries, there's something wrong deep inside of you, I'm afraid. There's no age limit to be a giant killer. What are you saying? I'm saying some of you teenagers or some of you, you more responsible younger people who aren't in the room, actually. They're downstairs. Be a runner on a bus. Serve God as a family. You parents, don't make this mistake. Don't hold your kids back until you think they're old enough. It's a mistake. Let them serve God as they feel inclined to. Amen. I agree, Rooster. Let them serve God as they feel inclined to. You know, if you're on the cleaning list and you've got kids, bring your kids up here with you have them help you clean. Give them a job to do. Give them a bucket of soapy water and a wash rag and put them in front of one of these doors out back and say, wash this whole door. Or wash the whole back of the building. That'll keep them busy for a while, right? They can only reach three and a half feet up it, but that's all right. Get them involved. Then when they're done, praise the fire out of them. Boy, you don't know what a big deal this is. You did a great job. Let's go and get you a small chocolate milkshake from McDonald's as a reward for serving God. Connect rewards with serving God. This is how you raise kids that love God and love church and love doing right. You've got to get them involved. Number six. Number seven. Number six. Giant killers see the cause. Verse 29, and David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? In Bible college, our pastor used to say this. He'd say, leaders see needs that followers don't always see. Giant killers see needs. You know, if you're walking through this property and you see a little piece of trash on the ground, pick it up. It needs to be picked up. Instead of, whose job is it to pick that up anyways? Well, if you just saw it, just became yours. How about that? Huh? If you, if you see a need, fill it. In fact, let me give you a need this morning. If you ever pass this restroom at the top of the stairs here, and that door is wide open so that everybody and their grandmother can see that commode in there, would you please just push it closed? You don't have to latch it. Don't turn the light on and latch it. The blue light comes on. People think someone in there. Just push it closed. Why? People don't need to, the, the, the last thing they see on the way into their auditorium doesn't need to be a, a toilet. Right? Push the door closed. Simple stuff. But when you see a need, meet that need. The lilies are dying. Oh, lily over here dying. So you see a dead lily flower. Pop it off. Throw it away. Simple thing little things make up the big things. Where are we? Giant killers see the cause. David said, is there not a cause? Giant killers see the need and set about to get the need met. That's what makes leadership. That was, that's what makes difference makers. Difference makers see a need and then say, we're going to figure out a way to meet that need. We're going to get it done one way or another. Man, I tell you, as we go through the city, sometimes we're just driving, sometimes we're out soul winning, and I'll, I'll see a park. 
In fact, I saw a nice park the other day. We were out soul winning on the east side, and, and a church, it looked like, had put some nice benches there. They mowed the grass. They painted the backboard of the basketball goals. They restriped the, the bank square, put new nets on them, and uh, cleaned the place up, weeded the, the, the court. looked really, really nice. I thought, man, that's, that's wonderful that someone saw that need and met that need. Now, be careful. Here's the cynic in us. Yeah, well, how long will it last? Well, longer than you're doing nothing about it. Why, why don't we stop going to the cynical side of things and start making a difference? And maybe us making a difference will cause somebody else to see us as we try to make a difference. It'll make them want to make a difference. Because that's how positivity spreads. Coincidentally, it's also how negativity spreads. <clears throat> Number seven. We should finish with this. This will put us at the halfway point. We'll finish it tonight. Number seven. Giant killers encourage others who are weaker without running them down. Giant killers encourage others who are weaker without running them down. Verse 32. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him, Goliath. Let no man's heart fail because of Goliath. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Isn't that interesting? That David would approach it in this manner. Eliab just ran him into the ground. Who's watching those few sheep you tend to? David said, is there not a cause? What, what have I done to you? Then he says to Saul, Saul, encourage the people. None of these people need to be discouraged right now. They don't have to go fight. If they're scared, they don't have to go fight. If they're, they're not inclined, they don't have to go fight. I'll go fight him. Tell them not to feel bad. How, how about this? Well, I guess if nobody else is going to do it, I'll do it. That's not David, and that's not his heart. And do we wonder why God chose David over Eliab? Eliab is the man of, who's tending those few sheep anyways? What are you doing? You're just here to watch the battle. And God says, see, you're not king material. David says, Saul, tell them not to feel bad. David didn't say, all right, if the rest of you losers aren't going to do anything about Goliath, I guess a 15-year-old has to show up and do it. Huh? Now, is that true? <laughs> In a sense, it is, isn't it? But David never says it. By the way, good time to work this in. You don't have to say everything you think. The fool uttereth all is mine. But the wise man keepeth it in. The fool is known by a multitude of words. You want to know who the dummies are? Look who's doing the most talking. And don't get on me because I'm the preacher. I often think, I, whenever I say that, I'm like, well, I'm the one doing all the talking. No, I guess I'm the dummy. You don't have to say everything you think. You don't have to say everything you feel. Well, I don't say it. I just post it. <laughs> Same thing. You don't have to say it. You don't have to post it. Keep it in. By the way, you'll lose influence with people if you truly tell them what you think of them. Because let's be honest, aren't all of us a bit dumb sometimes? A bit obtuse? <laughs> Even he knows. We don't want to be called on every time we do something stupid or say something stupid. Regardless of where we are, isn't there always somebody a bit sharper than us? A bit more intelligent than us? A bit more experienced or educated? Uh, aren't we glad they don't call us on our foolishness all the time? I'll tell you, if we want to have an influence for God, we've got to learn this example from David. You can be good to me. You know... The older I get, praise the Lord, and I say this humility, with humility,
humility. The more I'm able to see people as having not yet learned rather than just ignorant, right? When I was younger, I'm like, what's wrong with that idiot? Now I'm like, oh, they just haven't learned yet. And you know what? There's two very different approaches that I take. When I think somebody's just an idiot, because let's be fair, if, if you're in your 50s and you're still driving 45 in the, in the fast lane of the expressway, you're pretty dense. But uh, when I approach somebody with my mental attitude being of them being an idiot, usually I don't help them at all. But if I'll come to them with the understanding that, you know what, maybe they just haven't learned yet, I approach them with kindness. And I'll be honest with you, my flesh doesn't always like to do that. My flesh is very judgmental in nature. My flesh likes to, to, likes to yell at people and call people dummies. But I don't get to influence people that way. Also, 1 Corinthians 13 tells me this. Charity thinketh no evil. You know, when you love people, your goal isn't to straighten them out or fix them. Your goal is to help. And if you'll seek to help them, you're more likely to straighten them out or fix them than if you seek to straighten them out or fix them. Look what this dummy posted now. I want to straighten them out. Next thing you know, you lose the next hour and a half of your life obsessing over nonsense, right? Let's recap. We're done. Number one, giant killers are not lazy. Giant killers know how to obey their authorities. Giant killers get done what they're given to do. Giant killers know right from wrong. Giant killers know who the enemy is. Giant killers have no age limit. Giant killers see the cause. And giant killers encourage others who are weaker without running them down. And that's a lot of preaching right there. That's only half of it. Come back tonight for the other half. Let's stand together, please. Brother Dix is going to come to the piano and he'll play our invitation song in just a moment. If you're here this morning and you do not know for certain that you're on your way to heaven, come down this aisle. Get my attention. We'll have somebody take the Bible and show you exactly what you need to know in order to be saved. If you're here this morning, you've not been baptized, but you have been saved. You need to get baptized this morning. The tank is full. It's heated. We have everything you need to get baptized. Come down. Let me know you want to get baptized. We'll have everything you need. You can get baptized this morning. If you're here, you've been saved, you've been baptized after you've been saved by immersion. You feel like the Lord would have you join this church. You come and join. If you're here this morning, you say, you know what? I want to be a giant killer for God. And for the record, we need more of us. We need more giant killers. You say, preacher, amen. One of those things hit me today that you come and get right with God about. Father, bless our invitation time. Help us to do what you want from each and every one of us this morning. If anyone here isn't saved, let them come and be saved. If anyone needs baptized, let them come and get baptized. If anyone needs to join, let them come and join. If anyone needs to come and, and dedicate themselves to your cause, your service, your work, let them come. If we need to get right about any one of these seven things, let us come, Father. Let us do business with you this morning, please. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The piano plays. The altar is open. You come. Never hesitate. Never wait. Move on that first note. Come do business with God. You need to be saved. You come this morning and get saved. If you need to be baptized, come and do that. Don't wait on that. You'll not grow until you get baptized. Come do business with the Lord. Take your time. We're not in any hurry.
Thank you for your attention this morning. You may be seated. Ushers, would you come forward? Let's receive our offering at this time. Please be faithful and generous in your giving. I was checking to see if either of the hens laid an egg for the offering. They have not. All right. You get browns from these, Amy? Yeah. All right. Brother Rick, would you pray for the offering, sir? We used to have a breed of bird that uh, Araconas, is that what they are, Harry? They would give uh, green eggs or blue eggs. They called them Easter egg birds, and uh, it was pretty cool. So we had some that would lay white eggs, many that would lay brown eggs, and the browns are also varying shades. You see that when you put them in the carton of different shades of brown, and then the Araconas would be blue or green or a bluish green. It was pretty interesting. Uh, you say, what do they taste like? I don't know. I don't eat embryos of chickens. Anyhow, let's, uh, let's give you some announcements and we'll have you on your way. Prayer emphasis continues to be the spring program. Please keep praying for folks to be saved. Pray for people to be baptized. So far this year, we've seen 39 folks pray to receive Christ as Savior. 14 of those have been baptized. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Um, and keep praying that, that more folks will get saved, more will get baptized. Pray for folks that are trying to get visitors here. They're working feverishly. There's still five weeks still in the program. Plus, you got tonight. You got every Wednesday night. There's a lot of services that you can get people here for. Uh, I've been talking to some of you, and you're saying, boy, they haven't come yet. Key word is yet. Stay after them. You know, ask, seek, and knock. Amen. Stay after them. Uh, ask, seek, and knock in Luke 11 talks about praying uh, fervently and, and repeatedly going to God. Well, keep asking your people and, and bug them to come. Keep telling them that the, the end of the program is coming and they need to come for you. And uh, pray for those who are working really hard for the program. I know many are. And the devil's been fighting this time uh, around our revival. Boy, he came in full force trying to keep folks away and uh, whatnot. So pray for the program. Bible reading. Uh, beginners, you're reading Titus through James. Advanced, you're reading Ezekiel 31 through the book of Joel. So you got Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, and then Joel. You read the first half of Ezekiel last week. Finish it up this week. Then tonight, 5 o'clock Sunday school, 545 evening service. We'll finish this message. That throws your whole slide presentation off, doesn't it, Talon? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, come back tonight for that. Uh, McDonald's, hamburgers, and fries. Whatever we don't give away on the buses, we can have downstairs for the rest of you. We'll just have to see how it works out. Uh, let's see here. What else we got going on? Wednesday night, service at 7 o'clock. The quiz will be on, I guess, 2 Corinthians, eh? 2 Corinthians quiz. And then Thursday night, soul winning at 7 o'clock. Don't forget, when you show up for these services, you're counted for your team in their attendance. Amen. All right, that's all I got for you. Let's stand up. We'll pray and be dismissed. Look at here, 1130. What is the world coming to? My goodness gracious. And we even showed a seven-minute skit film during all of that time too, didn't we? All right, praise the Lord. Let's go uh, to the Lord in prayer. If you want to go fishing with Nicole this week, she got a new batch of dynamite. She's ready to go.
keep Shannon and her family in your prayers, please, as uh, they'll be laying her grandmother, Eleanor Hill, to rest this week. Pray for Eleanor's husband, Cliff, her grandpa. Uh, Clifford is 90 years old, and he's just now, his, his mental faculties are starting to weaken and uh, dementia is setting in. Thankfully, uh, Shannon's mom, Sue, is there in the area. She helps the family tremendously. And then her brother, Bud, Shannon's uncle, is living there with them too. But just keep that family in your prayers, please. Father, we sure do love you and we thank you for heaven. Thank you that we know when we say goodbye to our loved ones that we don't say goodbye permanently. It's just see you later. I do pray that you'll bless Shannon and the family and give them strength and grace and comfort through this time. Because even though it is see you later, we know it'll be a little while. We do pray your blessing on your people on this Lord's Day. Give them a good afternoon. Bring us back safely this evening, please. Bless our bus routes and our workers that work so hard to get those young ones here. Bless our teachers and help them also. We love you. We praise you. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. You're dismissed. See you tonight.